By the end of the 70s and the beginning of the 80s, Atari was a true entertainment giant. It's not surprising that when in 1981 a video game engineer and developer designed Centipede from the American company, it immediately became a successful title that served to build up the arcade catalog on the market. In this video, we'll have a look at its technical details, what was so special about its development and what was the impact this game brought for one of the last golden ages of the industry before the crisis was about to start just two years later. By that time, it was usual to launch an arcade version of a video game in order to measure its reception, and, if it was favorable, reprogram that game for video game consoles. It was the case of Centipede. Its eye-catching and stunning art were accompanied by a powerful CPU P6502 that was able to reach a clock rate in the neighborhood of 1 to 3 MHz. The use of this HB CPU, which was designed by MOS technology, became widespread by the end of the 70s and the 80s. So we can get an idea about its importance, it's necessary to point out that it was the CPU of Atari VCS, the computer Apple II, and even the Commodore PET. But even more, it was used in NES and Famicom, despite the fact that it had been slightly modified in order to adapt it to the Japanese console. But let's get back on Centipede. With its graphic engine, this arcade was able to show a palette of 16 colors on the screen that offer a resolution of 240 x 256 pixels, and it was installed vertically, so the player could properly see how the Centipede was roaming from above of the scene to the bottom. Concerning the audio, it was decided to use the well-known Pocky or Pot Keyboard Integrated Circuit, the most used chip in the 8-bit family of the American Giant. If we have to talk about Shigeru Miyamoto, if we want to analyze Mario's origins, and it's impossible to talk about Sega without mention of Yu Suzuki, it is imperative in order to explain the development of Centipede to focus on its creator, Jonah Bailey. On the contrary of what usually happens with some of the greatest video game developers, Belly had remained unconnected with the sphere of arcade before she started working on Centipede. Indeed, she hadn't been even related with the video game concept. It was during an interview by Vice Motherbo when she spoke about how she had been involved in the industry. I was living in Santa Barbara and I had a best friend who owned a record store, so the Pretenders had their first album, but there was one track that I really grew to like it, and the title is Space Invaders, and I tapped him on the arm and said, what is the Space Invaders? And he said, um, Space Invaders is this amazing video game. And I said, what is a video game? So he picked me up and drove me down to the grass shack my friend Phil gave me a quarter. I put the quarter in and things started moving and I got killed three times, bam, bam, bam. I couldn't tell what to do. I couldn't tell what I was, but what I could see was that the display on Space Invaders looked a lot like the display that I worked with at GM on the Cadillac. So I thought, I don't want to program for GM anymore. I want to program for Atari. Well, how is that Donna Bailey abandoned her job in the largest American automobile manufacturer just to start an adventure in a newborn industry that still depended upon the concept of toy? As you can guess, it's not an easy question. But the truth is that, at that time, if a company was able to define the American video game industry, set the pace and, of course, make a difference, it was Atari. Okay, Atari, let's see your best pitch. By the end of the 70s, Atari ruled the video game market with an iron fist. It was not simply that, with Pong, they had caught the golden ghosts that made them the kings of amusing arcades and allows them to gain millions by its copies, such as Super Pong, Dr. Pong, Ping Pong, or even Breakout, in which the screen has been rotated and Brick Rose has been incorporated in order to obtain a totally new game. Since its release in 1972, other successful titles followed. Gotcha from 1973 and the first Maze video game, Round Track 10 from 1974 and the first racing video game, 
and the aforementioned breakout from 1976, which started the famous bottom ball genre. Every one of them not only made Atari the king of entertainment business, but also put the video game concept in the spotlight. With the 80s, the video game crash made that industry totter, but not before Jonah Bailey had been the pioneer who got through Centipede. There are a lot of stories about its development and which ideas were soaked up. One of the best known stories is that one which states that the game mechanics, meaning having to hit a centipede that moves towards the player, is based on the Japanese legend Tawara Toda, or My Lord Back of Rise. According to the story, Fujiwara Hidesato, a historical character who lived during the 10th century, killed a jagging centipede known as Mukare under the Dragon King's command, who lived at the Ryugujo Temple. In return, the king rewarded him with an endless bag of rice. As this theory follows, the story, which was translated by Basil Hush Chamberlain under the title My Lord Back of Rice in 1887, will have arrived at the hands of the young team of Centipede. Has this statement something to do with the true story of the video game? Not at all. After you do something, people think that you knew what you were doing, but we had no idea. We were just doing stuff, and some of it worked out, and some of it didn't. Bailey was hired by Atari in 1980, and during a brainstorming session for the next Atari title, there was an idea that caught her eyes. A multi-segmented insect crawls onto the screen and is shot by the player. It wasn't a bad concept, so she chose it and it was the beginning of a new video game. When the game arrives to the amusement arcades, it was an absolute success. Some voices in the media went so far as to compare it to Pac-Man, and there were a few TV shows about the best strategy in order to achieve the highest score. The centipede fever had just begun. Sure, every kid who played the Atari VCS version knew that the main character was a garden gnome who defended its land from a centipede making use of a magical wand. But what about those people who discovered this game through the arcade version? The only thing they could know was that their aim was to kill a centipede and to survive the attempt. If they hit its head, the previous segment turned into a new head. If they hit any other part of its body, the centipede was divided into two of them and then the players had a new enemy to defeat. Added to this problem is the fact that the screen was full of mushrooms. If the centipede hit one of them, it went down one step and changed its direction. And what about those infamous spiders that never stopped showing up through the screen and harassing and killing the player? And to all this, we must add that the player controlled the character making use of a trackball, a popular control system by them. As it had already happened with Pac-Man, Centipede helped attracting female players and did not take long to develop console versions. We have a version for Apple II, Atari VCS, Atari 5200, Atari 7800, Atari 8-bit, BBC Micro, Collect Vision, C64, the IBM PC, the Intellivision, and BIC20, among others. In addition, the game has appeared in several compilations and even in cinema. And it has a sequel, Millipede in which we're introduced a few changes, such as its graphics, the millipede speeds and new insects, such as mosquitoes and dragonflies. Maybe, Centipede is not remembered as the most acclaimed all-time arcade. Perhaps we didn't know about Donna Bailey. After all, she left Atari in 1982 to work for Vidia and Antivision until 1985, when she quit the video game industry for good. Nevertheless, as same as her work, she deserves to be remembered for who she is, that is, a key piece in the video game history. Today, she gives lectures about the involvement of women in an industry that remains largely male-dominated. I knew that I wasn't nearly as technically experienced as many of the, the guys that I worked with, and I felt like that made me one of the most qualified women in America. Some people did and some people didn't want to hire a female designer. Women make up 10% of the workforce in video games at this point. 
and that really isn't much growth after 30 years. I hate that women have to fight against something instead of just being able to do their work.